My name is Jonathan Page. I am currently the Director of the Office of Multicultural Affairs and Title VI Coordinator here at Longwood University. Uh, I've been an educator for about 25 years. I uh, started my uh, teaching career in the K-12 setting as a secondary English teacher uh, before transitioning to higher education, first as an adjunct and then as a full-time lecturer uh, at Longwood University in the English and Modern Languages Department. Um, and so, Education for me has always been sort of that silver bullet. Um, it's an opportunity to address some disparities in, in equity. And so that's why I'm excited about uh, what I do. So um, could you talk about the Office of Multicultural Affairs? Absolutely. So the Office of Multicultural Affairs uh, is located on the third floor of the Upchurch University Center in the 309 Suite. And the Office of Multicultural Affairs was really born out of a couple of previous iterations at the institution. You know, it started as sort of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and it morphed into uh, the Office of Citizen Leadership and Social Justice Education. But what I began to see a number of years ago is that not enough sort of resources, you know, and attention were being given to our historically marginalized and underrepresented student populations. And how could we really help to support and advocate, you know, for these groups on campus to make sure that they had a space, that they had a home where they felt that um, they could sort of be themselves, their authentic selves, um, where they could engage with people who you know, kind of understood some of their experiences. And so out of that was born the Office of Multicultural Affairs. And what we do is we focus on three you know, key areas. One is on cultural events and programming. Um, for example, you know, focusing on the cultural heritage months, you know, calling attention to the positive contributions and the important things that, that we need to know about these you know, various cultures you know, that are existing you know, in our society. The second is engaging in diversity and inclusion education, you know, training in workshops. Um, again, a lot of that has a social justice focus, uh, and a lot of it is really focused on sort of understanding yourself and others. And then once we have that foundation, we can then build upon some of these you know, other elements that help us to address some of the, you know, the inequities of some of the uh, inequalities, you know, the disparities that are existing within the larger society because, you know, at OMA, we really focus a lot on, you know, inclusion and equity. And in fact, you know, we talk about all the time, and there's a, there's a, a wall, you know, sticker in the N.A. Scott Multicultural Center. It kind of has the motto of, of our office, which is that diversity is a fact. Inclusion is a practice and equity is the goal. And that's really what we try to do with our education and training is, you know, have people truly understand what inclusive practices mean, what do they look like, and what does it mean to create, you know, equitable opportunities and outcomes? You know, how can we increase access so that people have, you know, what they need? And then the third element of the office is really focusing on outreach and support for our multicultural students for our, our underrepresented populations on campus. Um, I'm really fortunate in this work that I have an assistant director. Uh, there are two of us in the Office of Multicultural Affairs. You know, I serve, you know, as I mentioned, in the capacity as director, and Mr. Quincy Goodine is my assistant director. And he and I essentially <laughs> do a lot of dividing and conquering um, because uh, there's just a lot to do on campus. And so a lot of what I do uh, as the director is some so of the um, larger policies, initiatives. Uh, I do a lot of the DEI work for campus as a whole. Uh, so I'm working with you know, academic you know, affairs within other departments within student affairs. I work with student success. I work with you know, enrollment management and strategic operations. Um, I am the co-chair of the University Diversity Council. Uh, as well as on the University Planning Committee. Um, so I do a lot of the sort of larger DEI work, uh, and also as well as really coming up with the vision, focus, you know, and direction you know, for the office. 
Quincy's primary function is a lot of the individual outreach to students. So he is an advisor to a number of the clubs and organizations on campus. He is also the key advisor and facilitator of our uh, Change Multicultural Your Student Caucus or Council, um, which meets weekly. Um, and so he facilitates that. Um, he really is instrumental in uh, helping to design, um, implement, and facilitate a lot of our cultural events you know, that we're having. Uh, and we're also really blessed to have three amazing interns you know, this semester. So that's another way if students want to kind of get involved with the work of multicultural affairs, um, we do offer internship opportunities you know, for students um, so that they can get credit for it. Um, and it allows them to really understand more of, of what the office does, but also uh, get a stronger understanding of, of what we mean by diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And so um, we really work well, <laughs> sort of in concert. Uh, and because he has, you know, such, you know, skill and ability and, and such a deep knowledge and uh, connection to the institution because he attended Longwood as an undergraduate as well as a graduate student and, and now he's back with us as a full-time professional. So he has that institutional knowledge. He has that connection, which I think is invaluable in, in helping him to work with students uh, because he knows firsthand uh, what they've experienced you know, at this PWI. Um, so again, uh, the, the rapport that he has uh, is really second to none. And so that's why I think together, collectively, um, we make quite a formidable force. And, and I really think that a lot of the work that we're doing is important on campus. Certainly there's more that we can do, more that we need to do, more that we should do. Uh, and so that's how we continue to, to challenge ourselves you know, year after year. That's what keeps us coming back. You know, each day is something different. Um, when I think about what multicultural affairs means to me, um, very rarely do you have the opportunity where your personal and your professional can intersect. And for me, um, the work that I do is deeply personal um, because I'm invested and I'm connected because I identify, you know, like many of my students, you know, that I, that I work with. Um, and so for me, you know, I think about the, the benefit that I had of when I was an undergraduate having, you know, a Center for Multicultural Student Services. I had, you know, people that I could lean on as mentors, that I could, you know, seek counsel from and, and get advice, that I could, you know, have a space on campus where when I was just feeling completely lost, that these were people who were like, come, sit a spell, you know, um, let's process, let's see what's going on. So essentially, it, it was a home, and I wanted to be able to create that same type of environment because for me, developmentally, it was critical. Um, and so I'm very thankful to this day, and I reach out to, to many of the people who, you know, as I was an undergraduate, really helped me to get through because I wouldn't be where I am today were it not for them. And so I, I see that as my then responsibility, that it's time for me to pay it forward, that I, I received the benefit of, of that kind of support, and I want students to here at the institution to have that same type of, of experience, that same type of support. And so when I think about our main role here in multicultural affairs, it's really to do, you know, four things. One is to educate, you know, not just our, our underrepresented students, but to educate our majority students as well, because we're a resource for everyone. Um, second is to empower, because we want people to feel as if they have agency. We want people to feel as if they have the tools and the ability and the platforms to be able to do those things that, that they need to do. Again, we get back to that idea of, of confidence that we talked about before. Um, third is support. You know, knowing that you know, in an institution where you can feel kind of lost, where you can feel a little bit isolated or alienated, don't necessarily have a sense of belonging or social connection, we want to make sure that people know that they are supported, that there's a place that you know, they can come, you know, to get what they need uh, to connect, you know, and the last piece is to advocate. Um, so not only do we, you know, teach students how to be self-advocates, but we also use our roles and platforms and, and experience, you know, to help the institution to create programs and initiatives and activities that are going to be really supportive, you know, of students to help create that, that inclusive environment discussing scenarios within the classroom at a predominantly white institution such as Longwood um, and with Longwood's statistics of being 70% white majority students um, 
how would students of color navigate being the only student of color in the classroom? Right. Well, that is not an unusual situation. And a lot of the students who come here to the institution are used to that environment coming out of their K-12 experience. Um, the challenge is, of course, how does one sort of create that level of comfort? How does one feel as if, you know, I can be my authentic self in, in this space? And a lot of that really comes from the way in which, you know, students engage in class or feel comfortable engaging with class. So a lot of that is really predicated on faculty members knowing who the students are in the space, um, getting a sense of, you know, do I have someone who is, you know, racially or ethnically, you know, um, singular in a class? And how can I create an environment that is inclusive? How can I make sure that the student's voice is heard? How can I make sure that I don't engage in microaggressions in a class? How do I make sure that I'm not looking to that student to speak for you know, the entirety of that identity group. Um, so a lot of that comes with just establishing a climate, a classroom climate, you know, that is welcoming, that's open, that's inviting. And I know that's a challenge for, for many because they'll say, I just want to teach the discipline. You know, I want to come in, I have a lesson plan, I have, you know, a goal of what I'm trying to do, I have some learning outcomes and objectives that I've established. But a lot of that also is predicated on the success or our success in being able to make our students feel comfortable. And it's very awkward being the lone student of color in a predominantly white environment. Um, and so we always have to kind of bear that in mind. A lot of times we talk about you know, the development of empathy, but it's also more the development of compassion you know, and understanding. So um, that's what I would say as some of the main things to, to consider. Um, there's no real hard and fast rule of, of how to address it. You know, I wish that there was some magic wand or some fairy dust that I could sprinkle and, and, and be able to answer that. But a lot of it is understanding the environment of the classroom, understanding your students, and being able to provide, you know, sort of the, the necessary resources to lead to success. Great. You mentioned navigating the whole. Um, so how do we, as students, recognize um, things like tokenism or, um, you know, going for <laughs> um, how do we not subject ourselves to that or try to, you know, make ourselves known, but not so much that we have to speak for everybody, if that makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's the big challenge is how do students of color navigate predominantly white spaces? And how do you do so, you know, in a way, and I keep coming back to the word authentic, because that's really what it boils down to. Um, there's not any one way in which to navigate it, but a lot of it is, you know, students understanding who they are, you know, being comfortable in understanding their identities. How open and how willing is a student to advocate, you know, for themselves? You know, how willing and comfortable is the student with sort of challenging things that go on in the classroom, things that peers may say or comments that faculty members may make. Because that's really part of how you, you kind of get through is to make people understand perspectives. And so when people understand you know, your individual perspective and how you're not speaking for the whole because your experience is not monolithic. You know, and so as we navigate these spaces, it's really understanding how to engage with each other. You know, it's how to communicate effectively. Um, that's the, the biggest sort of tip to, to navigating any environment is really being able to, you know, express yourself. Okay, so we're dealing with racial microaggressions in the classroom mm -hmm. and how to deal with the professor mm -hmm. or how to deal with the situation. How to deal, maybe both, because dealing with the <laughs> professor is one thing, but then, you know, will you be okay with how you dealt with it? That makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me think on that for a second. So, there's, and there's a fear of sort of retaliation. Uh, there'll be some repercussion for that. Um, 
that's a that's a good question. Um, because I think we all kind of might have an experience once that you're like, I don't know if I feel I feel disrespected, but how do I respectfully address it mm -hmm. to the point where I'm sad, not satisfied, but I feel that my voice was heard and there's something done about it. Mm -hmm. There are there are a couple of ways that, that you can go about handling that, and the primary one is when you experience the racial microaggression in class. Our first inclination is to address it in the moment. You know, I feel a certain way. This has landed on me. You know, intent versus impact. You know, this is how I've experienced it. This is how I've interpreted it. Um, so I'm going to say something. But oftentimes, in the moment, we have we are you know emotional because this has affected us. You know, and you know, I'm feeling a certain way. So what I've always advocated is not to ignore it, but to find the right venue in which to do that. So if this has happened in a class and the professor has sort of engaged in, in some form of microaggression, uh, it's an opportunity in a one-on-one -on -one situation during that faculty member's office hours to go in and respectfully say something to the effect of, hey, in class the other day, um, you had made this particular comment. And when I heard it, this is what I thought about. This is kind of immediately what came to mind. And this is why, you know, I wanted to kind of bring it up because, you know, not that I'm saying that you're wrong, but this was the effect of that, or this is how I interpreted that. Uh, and then let that be the catalyst for a larger discussion. As long with student body is majority, majority white, so is the faculty. Mm -hmm. So what are ways that students um, can work through maybe not having a professor that looks like them or comes from their particular background? Mm -hmm. When we think about mentorship, mentorship is the key. And we can gain understanding, insights, skills, and networking from a variety of people. They don't necessarily have to be people that, that look like us or have similar affinities and, and similar backgrounds. I think we tend to gravitate towards people like that because we just naturally feel a connection, you know, that I feel more comfortable, you know, in this environment working with someone who looks like me or has a similar experience. But I think what we need to get in the habit of doing is realizing that mentorship comes in all forms and that we as students can seek out those people that we need. You know, and so that is when we look at our disciplines, you know, in our majors, who are some of the faculty members who are doing, you know, the types of research or teaching you know, that I'm interested in and how can I connect with them to understand sort of how they do what they do or, you know, are there ways that this person can assist in perhaps, you know, pursuing undergraduate research uh, in exploring internship opportunities you know, looking at graduate school opportunities, you know, career opportunities. So again, when we look at it from the form of, of mentorship, because you're right, at a predominantly white institution, one that does not have, you know, a, a you know expansive, you know, diverse, you know, faculty population, um, there's still really good people here, you know, who have, you know, experiences, ideas, you know, that they can offer, that they can share. So a lot of that is predicated on, you know, students developing some comfort, some familiarity, and, and seeking out those mentors that they need. Uh, and at the same time, it's also incumbent upon faculty, you know, at a PWI to also seek out students to mentor, not just the ones who look like us, not just ones who we see as being similar to us and become self-replicating, but how do we share our knowledge? How do we share our skills, our talents, our abilities, you know, with a variety of students? As your overall like experience as an educator, in your opinion, what are tips for students to um, persevere academically in an environment that doesn't always cultivate them as, you know, for their cultural background, if that makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, I think when we're talking about overall success, you know, we tend to, as institutions, measure things through retention or through persistence or through graduation, you know, through academic success. So what I think we need to do in, in terms of being underrepresented student populations, you know, at a PWI, you know, identifying what resources are available, you know, via things like a writing center, via things like a quantitative reasoning center, tutoring, coaching, you know, finding out what resources are really available to provide you the foundational, you know, experiences, the, the foundational knowledge to really be able to, to grow. Because when we talk about resiliency, that ability to bounce back or snap back, that's not something that's innate. You know, resiliency is learned, you know, and we learn it because when we make those mistakes, we have people to, to help us to learn from that and say, okay, this is what you did here. Let's process that. Why did you do it this way as opposed to this way? So what did you learn from this particular experience? Um, and so really, that's the advantage, I think, of, a, of an institution like Longwood, is that there are resources that are available to students. The challenge is that a lot of students don't know that those resources are available. So they feel like they are isolated. They feel like they're on their own. So if they're not achieving academically to the degree that they should, um, they begin to sort of internalize and think, well, clearly it's just me. Maybe I'm not talented enough. Maybe I'm not smart enough. This is the best that I can do. Um, and so it becomes then sort of that self-fulfilling prophecy. It becomes sort of defeating, you know, and then you know, improvements and changes don't occur. So from my experience as, as an educator, it's, it's really, again, requiring students to at the same time advocate for themselves to kind of know what's missing. How often are you, you know, engaging in, in proper study habits? You know, are we managing our time as properly as we should? You know, so these are the pieces to the puzzle that kind of help us to be a lot more resilient. One of the things you and I talked about was um, individualism versus collectivism. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know in my Black or African American household, uh, my parents have always told me, practice makes perfect, mm -hmm. even though practice makes more practice. But um, or, you know, we talked about you have to work 10 times harder to receive half as much. Um, how have you seen in your um, career these, I think, statements affect students in a positive and a negative way? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's interesting when you bring up that whole idea of practice makes perfect. Um, practice makes permanent. You know, the more that we do things, the more they become sort of second nature. You know, it, it's sort of habit for them. So when we think about kind of what we talked about of uh, sort of that individualism versus sort of exceptionalism kind of piece, when we think about exceptionalism, that's sort of a slippery slope. We have to be very careful how we use that term and, and who we're using that term to describe. Because exceptionalism, particularly when you're speaking of BIPOC communities, underrepresented populations, when you say, oh, this person is exceptional, what oftentimes that indicates is this person is different from the rest of that group. So there's something about this person that is just innately different, and therefore we're going to hold this person up as being sort of the paragon of, well, you're different from everybody else. You're the exception. And so when we think about exceptionalism, if we're not careful, exceptionalism can oftentimes turn into tokenism, you know, where this one person is, again, set aside put in this particular position as being representative of a whole. And so the person then is not necessarily seen as the individual, but seen as the representative for the whole and is expected oftentimes to then speak for the whole. So that's kind of that notion of tokenism, which can be connected with you know, that notion of exceptionalism. Again, and we're speaking about with BIPOC communities, because there are people who are just exceptional, meaning that they have a rare talent you know, which others don't have. So again, we have to be very clear in the terms that we're using and how we're applying them because they can have the effect of being exclusionary. How does this confidence affect um, 
uh, by POC students academic leadership. Because, you know, Longwood is all about building citizen leaders. And, you know, we're told that we should get involved early. And for me personally, I didn't get involved early. So, and I think it was a confidence builder. And I feel that at this point, I still lack some of those things. But I think that it's important for students to know that it's okay to not have that confidence. But like, in your opinion, what are things that students can look for or can be done on campus for them to build that confidence? Confidence comes from community. Confidence comes from that sense of safety and security that I can be courageous. I can step out of my comfort zone. I can do these things because I know that I'm not necessarily going to be being judged for it. And if I make a mistake, I'm not going to be condemned for it. So when we think about leadership and its connection with confidence, you know, a lot of it is, you know, how connected are we? So we speak a lot about taking on leadership roles in those communities and environments and in spaces that are affinities for us. So if we think about a lot of our BIPOC students, where do they first go to seek that type of, of affirmation and support? It's typically going to be within our multicultural clubs and organizations. And so if we look at, you know, for example, uh, an HLA or a BSA or an Afro or in Asia, you know, even a pride, what you look at is students who are willing to take on, you know, sort of those leadership roles that are going to give them some practical experience, but they're not necessarily high stakes leadership roles. And then once you start doing that and you understand what leadership involves, and you have some successes that builds confidence, you know, particularly when you start to learn some of those key sort of leadership skills, when you understand how to collaborate well, how to be a true bridge builder, how to be an engaged listener, you know, how to make sure that you are including people, you know, into the conversations. So a lot of that is learning how to be a leader, because again, for very few people is that innate. The more that we do it, the more that we build confidence the more that we feel, you know, more comfortable to try larger and larger positions. So hence someone who has a first year student may be, you know, introverted, very shy, may be reluctant to take on a leadership role, but again, you know, starts out as a, as a freshman rep for an organization or starts out as a secretary or a treasurer or a historian. And by the time they, you know, progress, by senior year, they may be ready to run for SGA president or you know, some other larger you know, leadership role on campus. So again, that kind of confidence builds slowly because it's predicated or built upon success. And so we have to think about opportunities that we, or ways that we can give students opportunities to really sort of develop these skills. And if we look at our the Civite core curriculum, you know, what it's trying to do or what it's doing in our foundation courses, what it's doing in some of the pillar courses. If you look at the citizen leader development model, which is sort of a co-curricular leadership development, you know, program um, that's sort of modeled after, you know, what Civite looks like. It complements Civite very well. If we look at the mission of the institution itself, which is to develop citizen leaders prepared to make positive contributions for the common good. So if we look at all of these opportunities that are going to teach people these leadership skills because again leadership has multiple definitions is it is it positional is it transactional you know and so teaching folks the requisite skills associated with leadership so whether you're leading from the front leading from the middle or leading from the back you develop that comfort which then gives us confidence to step forward and do what needs to be done